ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of Making It in Asheville. Uh, each week we sit down with a local Asheville entrepreneur, artist, creative, and this week we are joined with John Hornsby, who is, at, from where I'm standing, a creative's creative. It seems like you touch almost every medium that I'm aware of, um, but John, please introduce yourself and then we'll, we look forward to hearing your story. Okay. Sure. Uh, well, I'm John Hornsby. Um, not sure where you want to start, but I guess I have been in Asheville for almost eight years now. Moved here from Baltimore originally and um, started out um, as, as an artistic kid, you know, very much into the arts, did a lot of art in school, and then I sort of transitioned into working in production art. Um, so I worked for a special events company uh, when I was in Baltimore that did themed uh, events. And so I worked in the art department there doing a lot of production work. So it was very much like theater. Yeah. We kind of did like props and sets, but for special events. So we would go into venues and transform them into other kinds of environments. Um, and every Thing you can imagine really you know ancient Egypt wow. or decade themes or outer space or what have you and so um, did a lot of hands-on production art um, there that was kind of how I started out as far as my professional creative yeah. career goes um, and uh, I I had a uh, big dreams of going to art school and being an artist um, that didn't quite pan out. I got accepted into the Maryland Institute College of Art um, there, but it's very expensive. I couldn't really afford it. I ended up not going. Um, but then I just went straight into working in the field. And uh, in a few years, I was director of the art department and I was hiring and firing all the people who were wow. coming out of that school. Wow. So I just kind of bypassed that part. <laughs> um, wow. And that was kind of how I got I started. It. Love it. Well, well, okay. So what are you, because I, I think we know a little bit about what you do nowadays, but for the audience that's listening that maybe yeah. hasn't uh, met you before, tell us what are you kind of up to now here in Asheville? Yeah. So um, I transitioned um, from doing special events work into working in the sign industry. Mm -hmm. And so I went to work for sign companies um, and again, kind of started out on the production side, on the design side. Um, and over time I sort of transitioned and grew into doing sales and account management and then, you know, department management and on to entrepreneurship. Um, when I moved to Asheville, uh, I was working at a sign company in town. Um, and I was there for about five years before I decided to go off on my own and do more freelance work. And that's been um, a combination of environmental design type work, um, more traditional logo and branding design work. I also do um, my own sort of art and illustration work. Um, and uh, so kind of a combination of all those things. I have really liked to work with um, kind of values-based organizations. I've worked a lot with nonprofits or with brands who care mm -hmm. about more than just the bottom line. Um, and so I've, I've sort of fallen, it started to fall into a little niche of like that overlap between art and illustration and design. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the design work that I end up doing is either kind of from that sign world and environmental design and thinking about how to apply branding to physical spaces, or it's like combining like drawing and design and sort of illustrative design um, into branding work. And um, I had, I had been, I was at Fast Signs when I first mm -hmm. moved here. I was there for about five years. I was part of the uh, leadership team there and um, was doing account management and sales as well. 
Um, so I would do a lot of on-site consultation, putting together proposals, project management, and design, um, kind of combining all of those skills. Um, when I transitioned into working for myself full-time, then I was doing uh, that for about a year, and I had another, another friend of mine, a, a, sort of a, a colleague in the field, who had another company that did a lot of um, mural work, mm -hmm. and he was doing, started to do more sign work and started to move more towards sort of combining murals and signage into sort of brand packages for independent businesses. And we kind of had a lot of mutual respect for each other. And so we ended up sort of teaming up for a while. And um, he had a company called Gigantic. Mm -hmm. And we teamed up together. And so we were really, our sort of secret sauce was we did these sort of bra experiential branding packages. So mm -hmm. it wasn't just like, oh, I need a sign. It was like, let's look at your whole space. Like, you've got walls here. What's the customer experience? Yeah. Uh, how can we maximize all of the real estate you have to apply your branding to create experiences that people will get excited about and want to um, drive like social media engagement, like creating, you know, sort of social media opportunities, yeah. Yeah. you know, applying murals to certain spots where it's like people want to stand there and take a selfie and um, and sort of leveraging that sort of aspect of branding into the mix. Yeah, that's so cool. I'm, so I'm wondering, because I think this is, if you're not in the world of design, this is kind of something that might be kind of hard to understand. And so, could, like, could you give us an example of sort of some of the projects that you worked on where you combined those two things? Um, like, was there a particular client or a particular mural or something that you did that, that you thought was a particularly cool example of that um i think one of the one of the more noticeable ones i guess would be downtown mm -hmm. there's a business called hazel 20 yeah. that's um sort of right near the main right off from pack square there um and so um you know it's just a simple combination of like you know let's not just do signs on the walls but let's also paint the walls you know and, and paint flowers on the walls and petals blowing down the side and um you know part of the thing oh we, uh, we lost you i think i lost you. yeah so uh you said it's more than just painting the walls and painting flowers that are blowing down the wall yeah so one of the things that comes into play when you're dealing with um is there's ordinances and permitting around what's allowable as far as a sign and you know there's size restrictions and quantity restrictions but art isn't um, regulated in the same way so you can paint the whole side of a building with something that's not advertising but it's eye-catching right and so it's still serving the purpose of drawing people's attention to the business um, and so combining that with, you know, you might only be allowed to do a sign that's this big, but we could paint the whole wall and, you know, put a big flower on it and people are driving down the road, they're going to stop and look and then they're going to see your sign It's going to drive more interest into the business. So that was, you know, a lot of it was kind of like, how do we work within the confines of the regulations yeah. to kind of push on that a little bit and um, get more bang for the buck for for people um, on their spaces. So um, that was something that we worked on together for a while. It was a lot of fun, did a lot of work that um, you know, we're both really proud of. Um, and then the, that was acquired, actually. His company was acquired by another local sign company, and we both went to work there, and that kind of got folded in. Um, and I was managing the sign department of of that business which was the allegra that's in town mm -hmm. um bought out gigantic and so we kind of went through an acquisition process there which was interesting and um and then uh you know things went on and we both moved on from that i actually um when coronavirus hit i was let go 
And so then I had to kind of refocus on, well, what do I do now? Um, I think like a lot of people probably, you know, in that moment, there was a a whole lot of soul searching going on. Um, You know, what am I doing with my time? What's important to me? What am I good at? What do I love? What does the world need? Where do all these things overlap? And, uh, you know, what the hell am I doing with my life? (laughs) And what's really important? Um, and so we explored a lot of different things, you know, I think we talked a while Mm -hmm. back and, um, you know, my, I live in a high risk household. My wife is immunocompromised. And so we have been, you know, more, more on the cautious end of the spectrum of the, the wider array of people's responses and behaviors in the face of the pandemic. Mm Um, so we pretty much you know, had to kind of think about how can we uh, refocus on what we're doing um, in a way that we can, you know, make a living without being public facing mm-hmm. too much as far as like, you know, customer service and being out interacting with lots of people. Um, and so, um, I mean, the one easy thing was just immediately like refocusing back on uh, the freelance design work. And so, you know, I started doing that immediately. Um, we were exploring some different things. We um, talked about, um, you know, we were exploring doing like a podcast kind of thing. We were looking at doing an online course on relationships. My wife and I, we, we work together a lot too. And um, that was something that we were exploring as well. But my wife's also in school right now too she went back to school um before corona hit um started going back to school to uh finish out a degree Uh, i've got two kids at home remote learning and um so i had pretty much you know before coronavirus virus hit i had sort of committed to all right i'll i'll kind of support you going to school and, you know, help do the heavy lifting with the kids so that you can focus on that. And I'll stick with the full time job I have that I wasn't really loving. Um, but then they let me go anyway. So that was like a blessing in disguise. Um, so we we played with a bunch of different ideas and then we sort of came around to uh, our most recent venture that we have going, which is called Connection Kits. So interested and... in hearing more about Connection <laughs> Kits. Uh, we we follow you, I would say, closely on Instagram since connecting. Um, and in the conversations that we've had, and I, I, I want to, you know, use a little, I'll say, preface as we as we go into whatever the Connection Kits are, are meant to be and will eventually become. Um, but there's something I, I want to say special about you and I, it and it's there's clearly this artist and some artists I don't know if they live in like you know uh their little artist den and they and they don't come out and they don't create or it doesn't show in the light of day it seems like you have done as far as I can tell an exceptional job of like showing your work being a part of a community um and and caring and so when I saw you announce connection kits, I was like, oh, this feels, and, and I don't know what they are yet. <laughs> like I wanted to leave it because I knew that we were going to have this interview. And so like I didn't click expand, tell me more about connection kits. I wanted to have this conversation. Um, but it seemed to me in the, our conversations that you use art as a way to pull people together, as a way uh, to build connection and um I don't know how it fits in the story, but I know that you you're, uh, you host some form or another of artist meetups or a community of sorts. Um, and so this all seems to make perfect sense. Please, with that, uh, you know, I, I'll call that JV introduction to you doing art and creating art, but also caring so much about people and connection. What are these connection kits? Sure. Yeah, and we should probably definitely talk about the community piece, too, because that's sort of been integral mm-hmm. in uh, my development in the community here in Asheville. But, um, 
basically, what are the connection kits? So we um, sort of identified that, um, you know, I, I am involved in several communities, and that was part of the impetus for this. Um, I am a part of the team for Creative Mornings in Asheville, and um, people who don't know about that, it's a, a monthly event that happens um, around the theme. It's a local chapter of a nas- international um, organization. There's chapters all over the world. And um, the, the last Friday of the month, they all gather to have an event and a talk around a one word theme. And today was actually this month. So this morning I was helping out with that. Um, Creative Mornings has been in Asheville for four years, and I've been a volunteer with them since the first event. Wow. And um, so that was an event that, in a community that was very much based around people getting together in a space, um, you know, not social distance, <laughs> you know, a couple hundred yeah. people together once a month to gather around, you know, a talk um, and to be inspired and to, um, you know, build their relationships with each other. Um, I'm also involved in AIGA mm-hmm. Asheville. I'm on the board of that as well, um, which is a professional association for design. And um, another organization that, you know, a large part of what we do is events and community and um, education and socials. And um, so, you know, I was and those are two communities that have very much supported me in my growth um, in Asheville. A- AIGA itself is, is, is a little newer, but the design community in general, um, and there's a uh, before AIGA formed a chapter here, um, the design community had a, a group called Asheville Design Salon, which also still exists. Um, but those two communities were something that I was were a constant mm-hmm. in in my transitions through different professional situations. And as I've been in Asheville, I've been involved in those um, for the past four or five years. And so when the coronavirus hit, um, I should also say in Creative Mornings, I've heard of my role there is I, I work with partnerships. So that's basically sponsors. So helping to build and maintain relationships with the other um, businesses in town that help support um, through in-kind or cash donations, um, the work that Creative Mornings does. And when things coronavirus hit and then all of a sudden all these in-person events sort of stopped overnight, then of course everything went to virtual. Um, and, you know, in the course of the past six months, I think we've seen that go from being um, all the different shades really. I mean, at first it was like, Oh wow, this is actually kind of cool. Like I can participate in all these events anywhere in the world. And, a lot of them are free, uh, and that sort of changed to, gosh, there's so many online things. I'm kind of getting it, tired of it these. It is a fatigue for so, sure. Yeah, so then, you know, Zoom burnout, you know, and screen fatigue becomes a very real thing and just over access to so many things as well. So we notice, you know, in usually in an event, if you imagine this little Venn diagrams of overlapping circles, you know, you've got the event host organizers speakers you've got the attendees and you've got the sponsors um and now all those circles are like no longer overlapping and just kind of touching um and so we were wanted to put together a solution that would reconnect those three things in in a meaningful way and so um, we sort of came up with the idea of these connection kits being that we would work with event organizers or online communities to put together um, physical kits that would get mailed out to the attendees hmm. so that they could have some sort of tactile um, interaction and not just be staring at a screen. Um, I think it quickly became a apparent once the novelty of the screen access wore off that like people don't want to be on a screen any more than they have to 
and they want more than just staring at a screen. And so we wanted to um, put together something that people would be excited about and to so, you know, kind of like getting a gift in the mail and you open it up and it's, it's fun, you know, it sort of ties into sort of like the subscription box sort of marketplace um and that is one aspect of what we're doing we do have one subscription box thing we put together but um it's the the main line is really working with um virtual conferences and things like that to say let's put together something that's not just like they're getting a swag bag like when you would normally go to a conference you walk around and you get all the stuff and half of it you don't really care about anyway Mm -hmm. um there's a little bit of that that might that might be part of it, but the more driving part is how can we put something in that is uh, sort of checks a few boxes, and those are a it has to be there has to be some sort of tactile hands-on activity that you could step away from the screen and do something not stare at a screen, but then it's a thing that you could come back and share with the community that's participating um and so you know everybody might get a same standard thing but then they sort of get to do their own version of how they um, customize it or put it together or interpret it um and then we sort of um, encourage people to share that online and use unique hashtags for connection kits and for the events um, that they can then go and explore and find other people um, that they want to connect with and so to help sort of facilitate that networking piece that would normally happen organically when they're just bumping shoulders with somebody in a room that doesn't happen very well organically in a zoom meeting mm. um, without some sort of prompting and facilitation right. so that's one of the things that we like, want to make sure it goes into every kit is something hands-on um, something that people can be prompted to connect around and and cause them to you know engage with other people um and sort of prompt them to interact with each other and make new relationships and new friendships and have conversations um it has to be fun and you know we like to say we like to infuse joy yeah so it, it has to feel good um so there has to be stuff in there that is like gives you the warm and fuzzies um and we try to, you know, have things that are, we sort of get into them, you know, uh, prompts around that sort of lead people towards wellness, mindfulness, um, self-care in different forms. Uh, so those are all things that we'd like to include in each one. So, I think that's all the boxes. Yeah, so, so practically, I, I, I like to, I don't know. I think I have a, a creative mind, but in in practical and like the creation of a thing out of thin air, like I puns come to me. But like, what yeah. to put in a box that you deliver to someone to, so that they can then manipulate it physically and then share? I don't have Play-Doh, uh, Legos. Like that's I have to use something else that I'm already aware of. What practically does that look like? Is are you like? shapes that people cut out with scissors like i don't what 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 might the physical component of those uh, connection kits in the early days look like yeah a uh, couple things one that um I, that i didn't mention before another solu- thing that we're trying to solve with this too is that we try and curate things to go into the kit now usually there's going to be some sort of some sort of theme that might drive it, you know, so like with the creative mornings example, use that as an example, we did like a soft launch with creative mornings, um, for their birthday event, which was last month. Um, that was their four year birthday. And we worked out a deal with them and with creative mornings, Asheville, not global. Um, that's on the horizon. That's that's target down the road, but, um, starting with our local community, um, we worked with them. The theme last month was, um, oh, what was it? Do you remember? I, I have, I brought one with me cause I knew I wouldn't remember this. Um, so, oh yeah, it was, 
Was it Spectrum or is that next month? Uh, Spectrum was this month. I could talk about that one too. But um, the, the, this was basically the first one we did. And uh-huh. I can't remember what the theme was. <laughs> but um, needless to say, oh, it was um, stress. It was stress. The theme was stress. Uh... And so we said, okay, let's put together a stress relief kit. Um, and so one of the things that um, I have gotten into during the pandemic with my art is geometric art. Yeah. Um, I've, I've found it to be very centering and meditative to just roller and compass um, doing ge- geometric designs and seeing what kind of things come out of it. So um, with the stress relief kit, we did like some custom printed oh, wow. gratitude journals. So um, I used one of my designs um, that I had come up with during the pandemic when I was de-stressing. Um, and we worked with um, local printer the Daniels group to produce these so another thing that we were trying to do is to curate things from local and or independent shops and makers that might be struggling now during the pandemic right um it we're trying to work with them to be like hey let us buy some stuff from you Mm -hmm. put it into these kits you can also slide in like a little discount offer for 10% off your next order or something like that that you want to promote. And here's a, a marketing opportunity for you that we're actually pay you to um, put some stuff in here, but not just anybody can do it. Like we kind of have to come to you and be like, right. we want this thing that you have for this. Um, so we, we uh, reached out to Garden Party, who's an independent shop uh, down on Beecham's Curve. And got bought a bunch of these little bath soak packs to put in the kits. Um, gratitude journal um, with, uh, you know, a little printed prompt sort of just explaining how having a gratitude practice helps reduce stress, helps put more joy in your life, focusing on the positive, making time for that every day, encouraging people to do that. Um we included some little colored pencils so they could color in their journal and um, also a, a sticker sheet and a blank note card. What, one of the things that we also gave people the opportunity to opt into on that one was they could sign up for like a pen pal swap. Mm. And if they wanted to, they could submit their name and address. We would randomly match them up with another person and then you know, send them each other's information and say, okay, get to know each other. You've got a card in your kit, write something nice. Um, you know, maybe you want to talk about what is stressing you out right now. Maybe you want to talk about what you're doing to de-stress, you know, using that theme of stress to sort of guide both what went in the kit and what sort of connecting prompts um, that we use. Moonlight Makers, I just listened to their podcast with you guys. You know, we got some of their little pins. Love it. And, and um, put those in, and so we we got like three different ones, and dispersed them. You know, each kit would get one, and so one of the prompts was, you know, take a picture of your pin, you know, post it on Instagram with our hashtags connection kit match, and create a morning CK, and then you know post something about you know why this speaks to you or what you got or what's stressing you out, what's de-stressing you. And then go find each other and connect and, you know, interact and have conversations. So that was one example yeah. of, of basically that was the, you know, initial one. We're, just, we're basically it's a pilot. Two, two months in yeah. on this project. I, now. I, think so. it's a, I think it's amazing. How many of those did you make? So with uh, Creative Mornings, they were willing to pay to do 50 of them. That's great. Um, so basically, the first 50 people to sign up um, got those mailed to them. Um, and then we also did a, did a few extras and gave people the opportunity to buy them if they kind of missed out and wanted to get one. Um, and then, you know, also to have as samples 
proof yeah. of concept sent around to other potential partners and collaborators. I, my business mind is racing. I think you're onto something. I think that it, that is, that's very cool. Sarah, where are you at? Yeah, no, I, I really like that idea as well. And I'm thinking about, um, it reminded me a little bit of this subscription that we have to a company called Holsty, and they're based in New York. Is that right, Tony? Uh, they, they started out of New York. I think both they the brothers are in California. But, uh, but every month there's a theme. And so sometimes it's, you know, compassion or maybe it's um, integrity, you know, Resilience. like a one word theme. And they work with different um, artists to, to design sort of a postcard. And then there's usually a reflection booklet as well with different prompts and questions. And it's just mm. a really nice, like... Like, it's not an email, right? It's a physical thing you get in the mail, which is always exciting. And it just sort of is that nice reminder of, like, checking in with yourself. And I think what you're doing there is, is you know, similar to that. Um, and, yeah. of course, very local and at Nashville base, which is cool. So, But has the potential to be so much more than that. And um, I'm I'm excited by that because I think that there are so many virtual conferences happening right now yep. and virtual uh, meetings. And there was, you know, I'm the capitalist. I mean, I'm like, there was, there was so much money spent at all of those that now there's probably budgets sitting unused that people are dying yep. to spend on something that is going to be meaningful and make an impact and, and, create mind share um and connection kits sound like a really good fit uh local or international you know um we i think back to our episode with um uh ui products and you know what started mm. as a single leather beer koozie uh, is is now a business that serves you know I don't know Mercedes Benz at every trade show that Mercedes Benz goes to like that's crazy to me that's Looney Tunes the first customer was uh, you know Highland Brewing and now they have worked with every single distillery in the Bourbon Belt nuts nuts but it's a yeah. there's a market for promotional goods and uh, creating connection. Very excited for you. Yeah. So, John, I know you mentioned as well, I know you've seen a lot of your work on your website, um, more of your, I guess, uh, personal design work. Uh, and I'm wondering, where do you get, how did you get inspiration for the style of design that you do? And, and what, how do you prompt your creativity when you're maybe not working on a, a, a super straight and forward sign for a client? Right, right. Um, so I guess, um, yeah, that's the thing. Like, I, I, I don't know that I, I mean, I guess I definitely do have a style, but I definitely do a lot of different things too. So I, yeah. I, I, I ask myself that a lot about like, do I have a style? What is my style? Um, I, do I need to have a style? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which I know, like the the professional answer to that is yes, um, but I do push back on that. Um, I I would say, you know, I if I go back to like early in my career um, when I worked for the special events company, um, it was very much um, copying everything that's out there, right? So um, it wasn't like you know we do this one particular thing. It's like Again, it's based on a theme, and the theme could be anything. So, you know, I would be reproducing French, you know, old French liquor ad paintings or, you know, painting, um, copying all the different styles out there. So that was kind of how I started, was just, like, copying everything. Um, but then over time, I guess I have a couple different things that I t keep coming back to. Um, recently there is the geometric work, yeah. which is, um, you know, working with a ruler and compass and, um, 
doing geometric explorations. Um, I often have been combining that with watercolor. Um, sometimes, um, a lot of times I do, you know, pen and ink type work. Um, so, you know, pen on paper. Um, and then I may color that on the paper or I may bring it into digital and do the coloring in Photoshop. Um, and, you know, there are pros and cons to both and I like both, you know, paper doesn't have an undo button. Um, and so there's just so much freedom with being able to work and rework on digital. Uh, it has a lot of appeal. Um, but there's also something about like not being on the screen too and just working on paper that I think is important to keep in the mix. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I usually, I usually always start with pencil sketches. I mean, even when I'm doing, you know, sign design or logo design, like I start with sketchbook and pencil, you know, crappy little doodles that do not look anything near like a finished product, but it's just, that's the starting point of like getting an idea roughly out into the world and then like refining it from there into something that's um, finished. And somewhere along that process, I usually transition into digital. Um, as far as inspiration, I mean, you know, I grew up, I've read tons of comic books when I was a kid and Mad Magazine and stuff like that. And so, you know, those kind of things definitely influenced me. Um, I come from a music background, too. I played in bands for years and years and um, did sound and I had a performance space where we had shows and everything. And so I did a lot of a lot of learning how to use the design tools was like making flyers for my band and my friend's band and CD covers and um, cassette covers back you know, in the day. Um, and, you know, Back when we used to just like cut stuff out of magazines and go to Kinko's and make photocopies, and that was how we made flyers. Um, and, and but I got into using computers back when like three was a thing. I'm 45, so I'm dating myself here. But uh, you know, I was got into digital pretty early on, uh, and now the, those tools are so much more powerful than um, when I started with them. And I both know how to use them pretty well because I've been using them so long and also don't know how <laughs> half of what they do because they add, you know, all of these features and I just do the things that I know how to do. Yeah, you know? I just need magic and, uh, lasso. <laughs> 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 right. um, but they definitely have like come a long way to make things that like used to take forever be like super fast. So that is, is cool to live in a time where we have access to those kind of tools. I've said it in other conversations and I, and, I, and I feel like what you're illustrating is there's something about kids who are in bands, kids who skateboarded <laughs> and kids who played like, uh, you know, World of Warcraft, who just are problem solvers, creative types who just figure out how to do the thing. Like if you're in a band, you have a show. How are you going to make a flyer? I don't know. Let's go to Kinko's. Um, and I think there's something very profound about that uh, and something very important, or at least a trend that I've noticed amongst, well, I'll say friends. Um, another thing that has come up as you talk about all the ways that you've been creative, I'm wondering in terms of, uh, you said, uh, should I have a style? The, a, a person, a type would say, yes, you should have a style. What I'm interested in perhaps more is like, do you have a process there's some important quote, I want to say it's in The War of Art, um, where he tells the story of this prolific author who wrote all these fiction books, and uh, he was interviewed once, and the question was like, uh, do you have a process that you write with, or do you like wait for creativity to show up and then you know capture it? And he goes, uh, great question, I wait for creativity. Just so happens creativity shows up every morning at 9 a.m., when I get my cup of coffee and sit down at the typewriter. Um, do you have any kind of like pra practice that you hold sacred process by which um, you're like, I need to sit at this desk for 30 minutes, whatever happens, happens. What's your process? Um, I have kids 
So the um, <laughs> before that, the answer would have been yes. Um, and now okay. it's, um, you know, I guess it, it, all throughout my professional career, like working in special events, working in sign companies, um, doing design work, you know, a couple constants there are like this sort of kind of high pressure environment. You know, when I was working, the, the joke that I like to tell is, you know, I was working at special events and I got tired of working 80 hour weeks. So I went to the sign industry so I could just work 60 hour weeks because it was just, you know, in events, you have a deadline that like you cannot flex. Like the event happens at a certain place yeah. at a certain time. And so if we have to stay all night to get the stuff ready and the truck loaded, then that's what has to happen. Um, and, and there's similar things come into play when you're working with science and so forth. Like it's not as critical, um, but you know, people have like opening dates, like, you know, we're opening up for business. People never allow enough time. Yeah for how long it actually takes to get what they need. And so it's always kind of rush, rush, rush and being constantly interrupted. So as much as I would love to, um, in my perfect world, in a few years when my kids move out of the house, like I'll get up every morning and have my cup of coffee. And, you know, I can remember a time when I used to get up and have a cup of coffee and sit at the piano. And like, that was my morning routine. Um, and I look forward to those days returning, but the reality now is like, kind of have to be like ultra flexible. Um, you have to be responsive. Um, and really the challenge is being disciplined enough to not let reactivity, um, win the day over proactivity because, um, a lot of the work I've done is, is, is so demand driven that it creates an environment where you could easily fall into the routine of being reactive all the time and not being proactive. And I think to really kind of move the needle forward and whatever you're trying to achieve, you have to be proactive and you have to take steps to um, make things happen and not just react to what's happening to you. Uh, um, we're we're giving some- snaps to that as as operating advice and it is um it seems in all industries in all spaces and in all vocations avocations that is a truth how do you how do you blend those two things because you can have a plan and if you just are all about your plan and not reacting you're doing it wrong and if you're just in reaction mode and not following some plan or some north star even you're probably doing it wrong yes so so interesting that i do uh yeah i live in that tension point between those two so i i definitely do think it's important you know i do have a practice of um just with life in general but it also comes into the creative process you know setting goals um having some routines you know you show up I, i definitely am not of the mind of like you sit and wait for inspiration to strike. It's like you show up and do the work and some days, you know, inspiration shows up to work with you and some days they're off somewhere else. Um, but you show up and do the work every day and that helps facilitate, you know, inspiration coming more and more often. Um, and you have to be flexible and you have to give yourself grace, especially in these times, you know, it's, mm. it, it's also, there, you have to be careful not to burn yourself out, you know, and beat yourself up so much like, to show up all the time. You got to give yourself a pass some days and uh, say, you know, what? I'm just today's I'm just going to go for a hike and screw everything else. Um, you just got to do that. Sometimes. <laughs> so very Asheville <laughs> of you. <laughs> but um, I do. Um, my creative process when I'm working with clients starts with active listening and inquiry. You know, we're going to ask questions. We're going to listen to learn. We're going to put aside preconceived notions, get curious, start to pick up on things. Um, 
I like to research. So I, I always include research in my process. I spend time, um, you know, and whether it's for a client or a personal um, creative project, if I'm creating something, you know, around a particular idea, I'm going to spend some time researching that. I'm going to go allow myself a, you know, a defined amount of space to go down the rabbit hole and just ex- curiously explore where does this lead and what leads to another thing and what's the backstory on this or the, you know, where did this word come from? What's the historical context? Um, I go down those things and I start to sort of identify where things connect. Um, Hmm. For me, connection, how things connect is very integral to my personality and my process. Um, I am a, a, a fan of the, um, I don't know if you are you familiar with the Gallup Strengths Finders assessment. Yeah. So connectedness is my number. Okay. I am not. <laughs> so how does a, it work? I think we have a Strengths Finders yeah. book in our library. Uh, but g- please give us a, a, a strength finders tweetable, right? It, it's another version of a personality it's, type yeah, it's, test. It's, it's one of the many types of personality type tests out yeah. there. You know, you answer a bunch of questions and through their psychological magic, they determine, um, I, I don't remember the exact numbers. It might be like 40 or something different kind of strengths. So it's strengths based. So it's focusing on. What are you good at? What are your strengths? Um, and the philosophy that you'll get a lot more traction, a lot more growth um, by focusing on your strengths as opposed to focusing on your weaknesses. Because if you work on becoming better at what you're already good at, you can get a lot further with that than trying to become better at what you're not naturally good at. Um, so my, I like all those assessments i've taken them all um and on that one connectedness is my number one strength which basically means that i easily see how things are um and what might otherwise be elusive to people who don't have that strength who have some other strength um and so i definitely focus on that a lot and use that a lot in my process how is this connected to something else? How is that connected to something else? What's the com- Where's the common thread that goes through? Huh. Um, that's my point of interest in the creative process. And so whether I'm you know, doing some personal art piece um, or I'm working on you know, some branding for a client, like that's what I'm looking for. Like where are the overlaps? Where are the connections? And how do we... Um, hone in on that and sort of bring that more into the forefront. Well, that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Connection kits. I'm, I'm 2021 is going to be a big year for connection kits. That's, that's my, uh, that's my hot take based on your strengths finders, uh, and our conversation so far. When I think of, um, when I think of our past conversations, the relationships that you have in Asheville uh, b- with the number of different groups that have moved digital, how are you making time for connection today? Um, is it engagement on social? Are you making phone calls? What does connection look like for you with people today? Um, I would say that. You know, the two communities that I mentioned earlier, Creative Mornings and AIGA, those have been um, points of focus for me. Uh, you know, again, when the pandemic hit, um, and I lost my job, and I don't know what, what's coming. We, we, we lost you when the pandemic hit. I'm just going to do a quick clap. When the pandemic hit. Yeah, and then I lost my job, and I was like, well, now what am I going to do? And there's a pandemic. It's not like, oh, just go find another job. Um, I basically said, well, I'm going to focus on supporting the communities that have been supporting me 
you know, that have been kind of my lifeline through, you know, ups and downs. And so I really just, um, uh, I, I sort of got more involved with helping to run, to hold space for things, basically. So um, I engaged with Creative Mornings to kind of help be one of the point people on the day of event to make the virtual event happen. So um, I've been helping with all those virtual events to um, basically help run the Zoom, you know, and you got to switch back and forth between sharing screens, spotlighting this person, mics on and off, you know, all that kind of tech stuff on the production side. Um, I've been helping with that. I, with AIGA, um, I, we, I worked with them and we put together a panel discussion on how to market during COVID. And um, I moderated that and helped organize it and, you know, reached out to people in the community, including two of your past podcast guests. We had Nicole from Moonlight Makers on there and we had Aisha Adams uh, on there, who I'm also excited. She has joined our AIJ board as our new diversity and inclusion chair. So I'm super psyched um, for that. But, um, you know, so basically I've focused on helping to hold space for connection to happen um, and then thereby, you know, engaging in more connection myself through that process. Um, so help one way that i've kind of rechanneled so my energy during your, this time your your audio skipped out um i'm gonna clap one more time but I'm gonna, i think you said something about uh you channeled your energy but yeah. uh, <laughs> helping to you know organize those events and hold space is how i've been channeling some of my energy and, and achieving connection um and then, you know, we're also, you know, very conscientious on the um, social justice front as well, and just helping to um, engage community around some of the important issues that are, um, that we're struggling with as a nation right now. Um, and sometimes that's applying my art to supporting different campaigns that are, you know, um, one of the things that we decided to start doing um, was uh, I was doing it weekly, kind of fell off the rag wagon, and now it's sort of periodically, um, but doing um, different social justice actions um, as an organization and then pro promoting those on um, social media as well and inviting other people to join us um, to help cut through the, like, you know, there's so much, and what can I do, like, okay, well, here's one specific thing you could do this week. Here's what we're doing. Maybe you want to do this if it speaks to you too. And we just kind of push that out on our social and our newsletters and um, support, you know, definitely believe in supporting the communities that are underserved and disenfranchised and using, you know, the privilege that that I have to be able to, to do that, um, which in itself is, a little bit of a, a struggle too in terms of like finding that balance between not being performative you know and being authentic and like mm -hmm. the balance between yeah. like using the you know a little bit of platform and audience i have to like promote these things but not in a you know not in a way that's like because i'm like trying to get you know an ally cookie or a pat on the back or something yeah yeah, gold star. Um, so that's a, you know, I've just been wrestling with that. And then um, also um, Brett McCall, who owns Better Than Unicorns, he and I um, were hosting a bi weekly event for several months. We actually just recently kind of pressed pause on it, but we were um, holding an event called Watch Stack, which we would basically gather people online to watch a talk on a subject, usually a TED talk, um, and then have a facilitated conversation around that. Um, and That's so great. that was also, I think, very uh, sort of generative with the community it, it, for the people who showed up. Um, we had some really kind of real and authentic conversations around a lot of different topics. 
And, um, you know, we had local people, some people coming in from New York and other places. And it was just, um, again, just sort of creating these containers for a connection to happen um, without necessarily uh, being so focused on like a specific outcome or message, but sort of like creating a space and opportunity for people to connect and kind of see what comes out of that. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, John, you're, you're involved in so many things, so many organizations and so many projects and ideas. And I'm wondering how do you balance all of that or how do you, how do you manage all of that workload? Um, do you have a specific day where you work on certain things or do you ha- use a specific project management tool to help you kind of stay on top of everything? What's your work process like in juggling? Um, currently, things? as far as project management, I use Asana um, as my project management tool. I definitely do need systems. Um, and I, I kind of geek out about systems too, um, sometimes to a fault. And um, I have a habit of kind of always like trying tweaking it a little more and trying a new thing. Like I definitely mm-hmm. don't just like pick a thing and then stick with it forever. Um, which is, you know, maybe not always the best course of action, but, um, currently I'm using Asana most of the time for project management. Um, it integrates pretty well with Gmail. Uh, I tend to use the Google suite of stuff a lot for keeping things organized. Um, and so I can, take an email and just add it to my Asana through a little integration. Um, I do that. I, I would say that I have a, um, an unhealthy tendency to be a workaholic and I'm trying to balance that out um, and not overdo that. And so that is a, a constant personal struggle <laughs> um, to t- sometimes take on too many things. Um, so I have been, um, making more of a practice of saying no to more things, um, so that I can make sure that I am doing the things I'd say yes to well and not over committing myself. Um, I do definitely, um, kind of once we get to like dinner time, try to be done and not, um, stay up all night working on things except when I have to um, and being aware of, you know, when I have to versus when I'm just sitting in front of my computer still and I don't really need to. Um, yeah. So my wife helps keep me balanced in that regard. We're very um, different in that way. Like I'm the kind of person it's been like part of my inner work is like dealing with this, issue of uh you know i realized that what's going on is i feel like i don't have value if i'm not doing something uh, and as opposed to accepting that i intrinsically have value even if i'm not being productive that my worth is not tied to my productivity um and so i'm working to untangle that my wife is very content to sit in bed and knit all day and read all day and I feel super guilty and worthless if I do that. I feel like I need to be producing. Um, and so I have been working on making more time to um, do nothing. And that that also has value or to, you know, do things of leisure. And that that also has value and is important. Um, so that's <laughs> profound. John, I, I mean, I just, that's some real work. That's some important self-work. I, uh, I find time for the leisure slash knitting experience, but I often will feel shame about it. And so I, I think that uh, while I don't think I have unhealthy work tendencies in present tense, I I do think that my relationship with not working could use improvement. And uh, I imagine that you're not alone there. 
No, I, I'm, I'm a lot like you, John. <laughs> I'm like, if I'm not doing something that's related to a project or work or I feel 100% guilty, yeah. which is not healthy. So I think it's very, very human. And, and you, you are in different places on the spectrum of that. But yeah, for sure. What kind of things do you do? in on your in your leisure yep. time so in my off time and, and i guess you know it's being a creative it it's hard to draw those lines too because part of what i do uh, i love you know like so like creating art is something that i like to do in my off time you know so i guess i would say non-client driven mm. creative work is i put that in the in the me time category um reading I, I do read a lot um like to read um don't watch a ton of tv but we um do watch uh some a little downtime on that tv and movies um definitely like to get outdoors and nature um go for hikes go to swimming holes that kind of thing um do, don't meditate as much as i should but i make time for it um Here's here and there. I do listen to a lot of podcasts. Yeah. I I'm an input person, so my second strength is input. Well, that's how you find so connections, means, right? You like that's, I constantly want to take things yeah. in, so I like to listen and read and give me, give me, yeah. give me um, on the input front. So I spend a lot of time uh, doing that, um, and then of course you know playing with the playing with the kids, spending time with the family. How old are your kids? Eleven and wow. seven. Yeah, I uh, don't know what that's like, but I can only imagine that that keeps the world uh, interesting. And I'm, are are you uh, currently? What is it? Are, are schools open? Do your kids go to schools that are open? They are remote, remote learning. learning. So, are you so, facilitating that as something else on your plate some days? Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy right now. I mean, I can really only get like half of what I would normally be able to get done in a day um, right now. I mean, because I have two kids at two different schools, remote learning, and my wife is in school. So the first half of my day up until lunchtime is a combination of when I can get things done because they're on school, but there's also, I have to help keep them on task. Constant interruptions of like, hey, I need a snack or I need, you know, my thing's not (laughs) working. Imagine your um, bandwidth has to be going. With, I mean, internet. What is internet like in a normal and like a multi-child home? Multiple video conferences happening all the time has to be. Yeah. Crazy towns. I mean, we've got four four devices going at a time with you know between me and the two kids and the wife. Um, so it's it's pretty crazy. So it's it's yeah. a challenge. It's a challenge right now. Wow. And, and do you do any creative things with your kids? Like, are, are they into, you know, art, artistic projects? And, and how do you keep them engaged in that way? Yeah, definitely. Um, both of our kids are totally creative. They're also um, entrepreneurial. Mm-hmm. Um, we've been actually using, you know, the, the whole Connection Kids thing. Like, my son helped art direct the logo so when uh, we were designing the logo, his he had a lot of input into it and helped design the logo. Love that. Um, when we did the first batch for Creative Mornings, we all sat down and packed these up together. Um, and so we worked on that as a family. They're always trying coming up with like their own different little money-making schemes, you know, like the lemonade stand kind of right. thing. But um, And uh, very much, you know, they... they like art a lot so we spend a lot of time you know doing you know painting and little art projects at the kitchen table together too that sounds yeah Yeah. that that sounds beautiful and fun and i can only imagine crazy as well when um when working with and this this i don't this isn't your expertise but you have two children uh i'm constantly wondering like how do you I, my heart says that everyone's a creative it's just probably a bit easier for a seven-year-old to identify as a creative when mom and dad say hey you're so creative and like participate is there anything that you've done particularly to 
welcome or bolster that creativity in your children? Yeah, I think I, I definitely am of the camp that I think everyone is born creative and some people grow out of it. I think you school know? often um, grows people out of it. I think if you were left to our own devices, yeah. we'd be in like, you know, fantasy land. Who knows what the world would look like? Yeah, so I think um, I, we, we definitely, I would say um, we try to encourage them to sort of explore their own creativity and not put a lot of um, judgment on them and try and encourage them to not um, be really critical about it either. If that, what happens, what does happen a lot is um, dad really knows how to draw and <laughs> My seven-year-old gets frustrated that she can't draw, you know, like like Papa can. And it's like, well, you know, when I was your age, I, my stuff looked like this too. And frankly, I think that looks pretty awesome. Yeah. Like, that's unique, and that is a really cool song. Um, and if you want to be able to draw like I can, you get there by practicing, right? And you, you keep doing it. And I can tell you that I also don't think I'm very good. And you, that will always be the case. Like you will never be as good as you want to be, and you can't let that stop yeah. you. Like if if the goal is to be like some defined, you know, reach some defined, you know, mountaintop of like, oh, now I'm here. I have the perfect artistic skill. Like that doesn't exist. It's just always a climb. And trying to instill in them that, you know competition you know comparison is a comparison yeah. monster of like comparing yourself to someone else so you you, fr you, you can't let that get you down yeah, like, you froze at the comparison monster sorry okay um you know that comparison monster if you compare yourself to someone else you're always going to be disappointed because there's always going to be someone who's better than you so you know try and focus on comparing yourself to yourself yeah. like if your goal is just to get a little better than you were yesterday if that's even a goal like work on that don't yeah. work on like uh oh, i'll never be as good as this other person like use that for inspiration but don't use that to beat yourself up you know okay. use your own you know that that's all you can really do is try and fix yourself you know, how, how good was I before? How can I get a little bit better? And if you do that, like, that's going to be a lot less um, stressful or a lot less depressing than saying, oh, why can't I be Picasso or <laughs> whoever, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, just trying to encourage them that, you know, they are, you know, intrinsically, you know, the way that they are right now is just fine and they should embrace it and that it's wonderful and we love that and it doesn't matter that you can't draw you know a, a perfect portrait yet like stick figures are cool <laughs> yes. i like stick figures they're awesome <laughs> yeah that's so true uh, well and i also loved what you said earlier in our conversation about how you you felt like you maybe don't have a one style that that you always do, but rather you do many different kinds of styles um, or draw inspiration from other styles to incorporate in your own. And I, I think that's an important thing to remember and not just for creatives, but for businesses in general. It's something that, that I know we've struggled with is like, do we need to niche down and, and focus on just one yep. thing? And it's like, well, no, like there are businesses that do that and there are creatives that do that. And that works for them. But sometimes, you know, other people kind of need to do many different things and dabble in, in different styles and try different, you know, different roads. So yeah. I, I, yeah, 100% love that. So, uh, John, what are you, what, other than the connection kits, looking ahead, what other projects are, are coming up and, and what other goals do you have for the rest of the year um well we just got um a nice little deal on the connection kits front actually with um the aiga national design conference cool and we're going to be 
we're going to be doing about 600 or so kits for that. Um, so I'm planning on leveraging that into more clients of that caliber um, for that. Um, I just finished up doing some rebranding work for Rosetta's Kitchen. Cool. Um, and I really like working with um, brands like theirs that are sort of embrace the kind of countercultural and community focused um, uh, vibe. Um, and, you know, I'm really, as far as like the, the art and design stuff, I'm, I, I am sort of niche myself in a little bit of trying to um, focus more on inner jobs where that intersection of the illustrative design playing together um, basically being able to draw as part mm -hmm. of it <laughs> um, and um, so I have been be being more selective about things that I'm taking on and not just taking anything that comes along either like if it doesn't seem like the right fit going back to like saying no more like that is something where i'm getting clearer about not letting the the fear of where's my next paycheck coming from drive you know saying yes to anything that pops up in front of me but really thinking about like is this a good fit on the relationship front you know between like how the client and i are going to interact um and the work if, if those aren't a good fit, then I'm just not taking it and passing it along to other people in my network that it might be a good fit for. Um, so, you know, honestly, I feel like the way things are right now, like <laughs> it's a real shoot in the dark to try and say, well, here's my plan for the next, uh, the next quarter. Um, you know, I don't know what's going on with schools. I don't know what's going on with a vaccine. I don't know what's going on with us being able to send kids back to school. Um, and focusing on that balance. So we, we, lost, we lost you for a second. Um, you said uh, it's, it's mostly a shot in the dark. Hard to bring kids to school or no, it's going to happen with school. I'm going to clap real quick. Yeah, so not knowing what's going on with the virus, kids going back to school, uh, our own family being high risk. I'm really just focusing on that balance between doing work that is the right fit, um, making making that profitable, um, and keeping the balance of supporting the family, not just financially, but time-wise. You know, I only have so much time, and... Um, we're, we are conscious of, you know, growing this, but also not letting it become a monster that takes over everything and, like, causes a bunch of problems in the family sure. unit um, by, like, suddenly, like, now every waking moment is revolving around connection kits or design projects. Um, so it's really about finding that balance. That work life yeah. balance. You, you yeah. said it beautifully earlier that tension point, right? Like it's the tension between uh, the good version and if you go too far and good, it's bad, right? Like I want to make money. I want to, I want to provide for the family. Get a hundred thousand person connection kit order. <laughs> you know, the wheels fall off. We're not there yet. Don't, it's not uh, today, you know, the, the objective. And I love that. And what I'll just underline and uh, speaking of time with family, uh, we're about to go into the speed round, but what I'll, I'll just mirror back to you is um, I think that a always good idea is to show up to a community and attempt to provide value and be of service. And what your story is a case study in is just uh, s s serving and serving through the medium that seems to give you life um, I, I am impressed and amazed and inspired by how many different places you show up and create connection and provide value. And I, I'm very confident that things will fall in your direction. Uh, and I'm very excited specifically on connection kits, but I think that you'll, with the way that you're showing up, uh, things will 
show up for you. And uh, so thank you for sharing your story. And we're going to move into what is loosely considered a speed round, slightly uh, less business and story focused questions. First of which will be on if someone were to attempt to give more time to themselves to pursue creative arts, is there a like 101 that you find really interesting uh, as a tool medium lesson education platform around being more creative? Um, I guess I'll take this moment to plug someone that I've gotten really obsessed with. <laughs> Um, there's a, there's a gentleman named Robert Edward and, um, Robert Edward, he's part of what Robert Edward Grant. Okay. Um, and he is, um, part of what has gotten me into doing this geometric, um, explorations. And, um, there's a whole big rabbit hole of mind blowing stuff. You can go down if you go and, um, start learning about him, but he's, I think, one of the most brilliant people on the wow. planet right now, and he's making a lot of really interesting discoveries uh, uh, around like a unified theory of everything: mathematics, music, art, um, space, space, time. Um, so um, that's one rabbit hole I would recommend. But really, just starting anywhere, start where you yeah. are. You know, if um, pick up. Uh, a pen and a piece of paper and just start where you are if you make a practice of showing up um, you will um, make progress and if you don't get overly attached to the outcome then you'll make even more progress because you won't get hung up in your own judgments of like oh I'm not any good yeah. you know just do it for its own sake don't do it because you know you want to be recognized or you know it's its own um, its own reward here, here. if you take time to do I it. Yeah, that. I like that too. So I'm, I'm wondering too what um, what one tool, uh, maybe it's a particularly particular type of pen or um, paint, but one what one artist tool, like physical tool, that you would use if you could only choose one for the rest of your life. Oh, if I could, only, if I could only choose one for the rest of my life, it would probably be a pen, uh, an ink pen, and you know, like a micron. Um, yeah, either a pen or a pencil. <laughs> oh my god, a mixed media artist! You're making him choose this thing. Okay, um, and I think I know the the pen that you're talking about. If there's a specific one, I'd love to know it. Um, cool. You said that you're a reader. Uh, Please let us know what's on your nightstand, bedside table, or a book that you read in the last handful of months that really stands out. I would say the book that stands out the most in the past few months is on the fiction front is The Starless Sea. Hmm. The Starless Sea. It's fiction. Uh to inside book cover, is is it about a sailor? <laughs> okay. No, it's not. It's um, it's a it's a it's an interesting book. It's um, it's kind of like it, it's a fantasy novel um, that sort of revolves around gamification and um, another sort of kind of hidden world. Um, around books and within books and um, involves a, a lot of keys and doors and bees. Ah, well, you have my... Keys and doors and bees. Love it. <laughs> so, final question of the speed round is, if we had a magic wand or someone in our audience had a magic wand, what one thing would you ask for right now? A new president. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Well, we, we're going to find out in a couple of months. Yeah. Not even, I guess. We might time this one it's to come out in November. And you might get your wish. Um, 
heard and and thank you. And what we'll say now is the final, final, final questions are if a listener wanted to connect with you, how would you advise they do it? Sure. Um, you can find me on Instagram at John Horns. My handle is John Horns Be Creative. Um, also, Connection Kits is on there. It's, it, Connection Kits is the handle. Um, you can find me on my website. It's johnhornsbecreative.com. And um, if you're interested in Connection Kits, that's connectionkits.biz. And those are the, the main places where I'm hanging out. Perfect. And we'll have links to all of that on both the show notes page and the descriptions of the YouTube and on uh, Instagram posts, all of it. So we'll have many ways for people to connect with you. John, thank you so much for your time today and for you know all of the work you're doing to connect people in the community. Really excited and, and grateful that you shared your story with us today. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. It has been. Um, episode is over. Did we miss anything? Is there anything you're hoping to share that we like missed? Just swung right past? Like a ship in a starless night? <laughs> I think we covered a lot of different ground. Um, nothing jumps out at me. Well, I, uh, A, thank you. I know that this is a long time coming. Um, we will chop all this together and clean up uh, the parts that lie. I think that the story you told today is a, is a very real and very Asheville story. And the part that stands out to me is just how much you're doing to connect and be of service. And I want to shine that light back to you and let, let you know that it's not going unseen. It's really cool. Thank you. Yeah, and you guys too. Congratulations on best podcast in Asheville. <laughs> yeah. Best podcast about Asheville in Asheville, uncontested. I was like, like they sent us an email. I was so excited about it, and then I was like, uh, when it came out, I was like, there's nothing. There's no number two or number three. <laughs> there are so many other people with podcasts. No one. I mean, I guess it's it's a funny thing, but we are humbled by the the you know, I guess, reception or the welcoming arms of Asheville. Uh, the community has been very grateful. For sure. But it, it does feel like a participation trophy. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll take it. Hey, we'll take I will, it. I, it will be on <laughs> my... That's what you get for Nietzsche. <laughs> you knit Nietzsche down to where you have the competition. <laughs> <Yeah. you're> right. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, it was... That's funny. Thank you. And uh, working on hearing uh, a compliment and just saying thank you. But in the meantime, I will dismiss <laughs> it as, oh, our participation trophy. Hello. <laughs> it was great. I totally relate to that. So uh, what do you, anything anything <laughs> fun happening uh, on Friday night? You have to do like pizza night or uh, watch a movie? What's happening? Friday night is pizza night. Um, we have since the pandemic started, been watching Star Trek night with the family. We, we went through the whole next generation, and now we're on Voyager. <laughs> and um, so we'll do that. And then tomorrow, we're heading to the beach for... Great. Which beach? Hurdle. Nice. I've never been, but uh, enjoy it. Enjoy the time. We're going to have you say, wave. We haven't... Yay! We haven't been doing these. We keep forgetting to take pictures. Perfect. Um, but thank you so much. Hey. And you froze in that position. I need to you. do that too. Can I take a selfie? Yeah, yeah, yeah go for it. Sarah, wave. Hey. <laughs> cool. Um, hey. Awesome. Please, uh, again, I'm really into these connection kits. One of the, so uh, Morgan. on, yeah, like I'm kind of 80 20 on making it creative right now, where 80 is somewhere else. That somewhere else is connected to a number of businesses that are just all, all they do is sell virtual events. Um, mm -hmm. Let me know if and when you would like introductions to things that aren't directly in your network when 
maybe you have the kinks worked out or the pitch or whatever, however it can be helpful, please let me know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're looking at, you know, talking to people about 2021 Perfect. at this point. So we're doing the, the AIGA conferences in November, um, and we were trying to um, not – actually take something on for this year, but that was too good to pass That seems like an incredible opportunity. Um, Oh, you froze. So you might have said, no, Tony, you're dumb. (laughs) 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 But it does seem like a fail. Okay, (laughs) it's tough. Um, But yeah, so excited for you. Just let us know what service looks like. If it's uh, feedback on the website, looking at pitch, I don't know what, what, could be helpful, but I, I think I think you got something. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, we'll keep you posted, Please. and maybe there's some way we can collaborate on something down the road. Heard. Yeah. heard. Um, awesome, John. Thank you. Thanks, Enjoy John. your Friday. All right, you guys have a good one.